a state budget compromise with a unanimous vote from both sides of the chamber. Tonight, our political roundtable wraps up this year's General Assembly session. This is What Matters. Good evening, I'm Kathy Lewis. It's a wrap. The 2011 Virginia General Assembly is history with hits and misses and an extraordinarily challenging economy. We're joined tonight by Dr. Jesse Richmond from Old Dominion University. He has written extensively about legislative initiatives. And then we have two reporters who saw the good, the bad, and the ugly. Kimball Payne back with us in the studio after his coverage of this 47-day session. He's the political reporter with the Daily Press as well as a, the columnist for the Shadplank political blog. And also with us from the Virginian Pilot is editorial page writer Christina Knuckles. Great to have all of you with us today. Thank you so much for being here. Mm -hmm. I feel like it's the post Oscars and we're raiding the party. I, it's going it's to be kind of fun. Uh, so, Kimball Payne, and welcome back. This is a new set. You're, you've not been on our new set because no, no. you were decamped to Richmond while we introduced it. So, welcome to your new editorial home. You've, uh, you've upgraded nicely. Uh, we have. What was for you? I That's appreciate why. it. That's <laughs> why. Uh, so, so, give us your take on the 47 day session. Went later than we thought it was going to? Yeah, but it wasn't a big overtime. It wasn't, I don't see that as a big deal. I mean, that was one of the places where, where there's always a little bit of wiggle room. That's and you happened. Have, you have yeah. brinksmanship, and you mm -hmm. have brinksmanship, and you end up with an extra day. Um, I, I don't know that there's, a, there's an overwhelming theme. I think, you know, you look at the General Assembly session, and you look at the year, and I think what we'll be talking about for months from now is probably redistricting because of what is holding over these folks' head. They don't know what district they'll be running in. They don't know exactly how the election season is going to is going to bear out. I mean, you know that the primaries come in August and then they got to run for re-election yeah. in November. But I mean, I think you saw hits and misses depending on what your party is or depending on where your your background is. I mean, clearly the governor, you know, missed with some of this liquor store privatization, but also managed to get Democrats to agree to his transportation plan, which I think is no small feat. Now he's got to prove how $3 billion can make a real dent in transportation. Um, but I mean, there was, there was a, a potpourri for just about yeah. everybody. Yeah. And we'll talk in the course of our conversation about some of the bills that passed and some of the bills that didn't. But this issue of redistricting is really critically important. And, and the, the observation that some have made, Christina, is that that's why the lawmakers were, in some respects, a little bit pulled back this time around, because they know everybody, the House and the Senate, face election in the fall, and the map will look very different. That's right. Um, almost every year um, when there's a controversial bill that comes up, people will say, well, you know, this is an election year. We can't do this. And every other year it really is an election year. But this is the level of uncertainty is much greater. People don't know what their districts are going to look like. They don't know whether they're going to have primary opponents because they don't know who will live in that district. And then they have the general election at the end. And it does affect all 140 legislators. So, so here in Hampton, roads, we think that there are some seats that will go away, right? Uh, there's a good chance there are a large number of districts that are 10, 15, 20,000 short in population. And as you crunch all of that, there's a chance that this region will lose representation and Northern Virginia really will be the I was going to say, there, there's a chance that we will lose. No doubt that Northern Virginia will we know, gain, we right? Know, we know that the migration yeah. is north. Yeah. I mean, that that's about it. But you look, I mean, just looking on the peninsula on the Senate side, the two Senators on the peninsula, John Miller and Mamie Locke, they're both, you know, 20, 21,000 voters short. So where does that go? Do they get stretched further up the peninsula and then someone from Southampton Roads come? I mean, it's the, the sort of, you're, you're moving puzzle pieces around and dragging voters yeah. with them. And it, it's not, I mean, it's, there's a reason why they take months and the <laughs> Department of Justice has to approve it at the end. Yeah, and Dr. Jesse Richmond, this issue of redistricting is no small matter. Of course, the census gets done every 10 years and then uh, we re redraw the maps. I I'm guessing the, it's just astounding to me to look at how these districts wind up looking at the end of the day. Uh, the governor has appointed this bipartisan commission mm -hmm. to make some recommendations, uh, former right professor at Virginia Commonwealth in charge of that thing. Is that a, a good strategy for him from a political perspective? And to what degree do they have to really go along with those recommendations? Well, the ultimate district lines will be the result of compromises between the House of Delegates, the Senate, and the governor has some say, too. I, I, th I see the Bipartisan Commission partly as a way for the governor to try to get some agenda setting 
uh, power in this negotiation and try to get more sway in shaping what the district drawing conversation looks like. I think he was also responding to various efforts uh, to push the state towards a more bipartisan, perhaps a more neutral approach to drawing mm -hmm. district boundaries. Uh, Virginia 21 sponsored this competition. ODU That's has a team. Various yeah. southern universities across the state have teams. Uh, our students are drawing district lines now, uh, and they're going to, there's going to be a judging uh, the yeah. 22nd of March, uh, present the maps in uh, the capital. And those and will be, so, so we'll have the ones that the college, and these are college students all across the state. All across the state. Who now have access to data college students didn't, I guess, used to have, right? Yeah, and, and, and map drawing programs. Uh, you, it's a complicated thing, drawing yeah, sure. district boundaries for. Uh, so what is the prize if the, if the students win? Free they, tuition? No. No, no, no it's not <laughs> Nothing that good. like but, that. <laughs> but they get, I, I think the winning team gets about $1,000. Okay, well, that's, that's, and, I think and this is a, a very interesting exercise. for each chamber. So, yeah. Uh, at the state level and then also the congressional yeah. districts. I think it's a very interesting exercise. It yeah. is. I mean, the state has lost the opportunity to have reform on for redistricting this year. But unlike 10 years ago where there were computer programs to really block by block pick voters that legislators had access to, this year other people can do their own maps, can right. go on the internet and look, and they can literally see what it would be like if maps were drawn by people who were not concerned about the Republican and Democratic breakdown of each district. And so they will literally be able to imagine life with redistricting reform, even if we don't have it. It's, a, it's an amazing thing. So uh, let's, let's walk through some of the results in this session. I know there was great concern, Kimball Payne, among school districts across the Commonwealth about what was going to happen now that the stimulus funding is gone. And it, it sounds like the legislature was able to hear that, hear that concern. Well, I mean, there's, listen, every year when you start splitting up the money and splitting up the pie, and especially when you have lean years, I mean, there's there's that concern there, and the, the Education Association is always out on on point and in front of that, trying to say, hey, this is this is where it could have an effect, and this is where, where you might want to watch out. But, I mean, you didn't hear widespread angst or, or widespread, you know, problems with the budget at the very end, which is usually a good sign when, when, when everyone's kind of a little bit unhappy yeah. with the budget, but nobody's, you know, that drastically But at the with end it. of it, there was this very interesting emotional uh, debate about abortion and about the, um, the, the health status of clinics and whether they ought to be more like hospitals. Walk us through that story, if you will. Well, it's one of these, it's, it's a bill that the House has sponsored consistently and that the House Republicans have championed and has never really gone anywhere on the Senate side. And I, th I think even when uh, Ken Cuccinelli was a senator, he tried to push a bill um, that was similar to this and just couldn't get any traction. So it would Senate. just go to committee in the Senate It'd and go to committee die. And, and die yeah. away. And at this point, uh, what, what the House did was it took a bill that was designed to, to ask hospitals to upgrade in emergency preparedness and other things, and it really just added a single line that said, and treat abortion clinics as hospitals. And, and, I mean, more or less, and sent it back to the Senate to get a floor vote. And what you ended up with was a floor vote where the Democrats are up 22 to 18 in the majority, but two Democrats, uh, Chuck Colgan and, uh, why am I? Phil Puckett. Phil Puckett, excuse me, are the, the two that voted mm -hmm. f for treating abortion clinics like hospitals. And it really did spur this emotional debate. I mean, you saw, you know, the, the, the Senate is a very, it's ruled by, by very strict rules and, and sort of, you know, it's very a more demure, state, restrained exactly. kind of body. Yeah. And you, you could see the tension. You could see, I mean, just in their statements back and forth, that it was, it was a, it was a high pressure vote yeah. for them, and it ended up being a 20 to 20 tie, which kicked the decision to the lieutenant governor, and Lieutenant Governor Bowling approved the uh, the new rules. Now, basically, what ends up happening is for the next, you know, almost 300 days, the Board of Health comes up with new rules to over to oversee abortion clinics in a, in a way that the abortion clinics have not been regulated in Virginia in a long, long time. I mean, they're regulated as doctor's offices mm -hmm. where you could have, you know, outpatient procedures and whatnot. So, and of course, the accusation is that this is a chipping away at abortion rights. That's right. And that certainly is the motivation of many of the supporters of that bill. Uh, the exact outcome could be months, perhaps years away. Uh, uh, most of the Board of Health that will make the regulations uh, currently a majority or were appointed by Governor Tim Kaine, who was pro-life, but was not as motivated by um, 
the goal of trying to restrict these clinics. There could be, there will almost certainly be lawsuits. So in the short term, really, maybe the reaction is political. Who um, benefits in the election from this? Um, e either you view it as there's progress here for your side, or you view it as uh, rights are endangered. And I think both the Republican and Democratic parties will be using that issue a lot in the elections this fall. Well, it's going to be uh, fascinating. And the other bills, some of the other bills that pass 30 minutes a day or 150 minutes a week for exercise for kids in school. Interestingly, uh, a number of immigration bills out there, none of which seem to get much traction. Dr. Richmond, what do you make of that? Well, again, you have this pattern where the Senate takes House bills and the, as we see with that abortion provision, these might be bills that would pass if they came to a vote on the floor of the Senate and senators had to take a position with their constituents watching. But the bills get sent to committee. The committees are often uh, filled with members who hold particular viewpoints and they die. And, uh, and never you say there's a, there's a way in which this works for people who don't necessarily want to face that moment on the floor where they right. have to make a, a vote. What, one of the things the committee system does is it can spare members facing that tough vote where you're either with your party or you're uh, not and perhaps you're angering constituents. Uh, you block those bills, you keep them from the floor and and say, what a you shame, couldn't vote on it. Couldn't huh? vote on yeah. it. I support it. But uh, there you go. There you go. And, and, so, and, and, it goes on both sides because you got, you know, like the illegal immigration bills came yeah. from the House, ended up dying in the Senate. You, you had bipartisan redistricting coming from the Senate yes, dying exactly. in the House. You had, you know, bans on text messaging while driving coming from the Senate dying in the House. I mean, both sides use the committee system to their advantage to kind of bottle up legislation that they're not interested so in. So what did we make of the role of the Tea Party in, uh, in, in this session? There was uh, the House bill that passed uh, that begins the process of amending the state constitution. Well, there were various uh, bills that the Tea Party supported which passed the House. Uh, for, for example, they, there was an effort to kill the uh, current interpretation of the Commerce Clause of the U.S. Constitution. Currently, the federal government and Supreme Court cases have backed this up, uh, including recent cases. Uh, Scalia even voted in, with a case in 2005 backing it up. Uh, saying the federal government has power to regulate commerce that's taking place within the boundaries of a, a particular state. Uh, House passed a law saying, no, actually not. Any commerce which is taking place in Virginia, as long as it's directed at uh, commercial exchanges within Virginia, manufacturing, production, et cetera, uh, federal government can't regulate that. Uh, would have set up an interesting conflict between state law and federal law. Federal law trumps state law in those circumstances unless the Supreme Court wound up uh, voting in a way that uh, would be rather unexpected. And then there was the, uh, the issue with eminent domain and the, the bill around that. Did you write much about that? Um, we did, mm -hmm. uh, and there, there was some progress made for those who wanted stronger property rights, and that bill was very complex and went through even some very strong, very strict interpretations where if uh, changes to an adjoining piece of property was affecting your property, uh, then you uh, could claim damages as a result of that, and they, uh, property rights uh, proponents made some gains, did not go quite that far. Uh, there were concerns from utilities and VDOT about what, whether they'd ever be able to build a road or put in a utility line again. But, but certainly they made some progress on that. Whereas I, I think that was probably the Tea Party's primary emphasis. Other than that, they seemed a little scattershot. They came out against the governor's transportation bonds after it was pretty much a done deal. Mm. So there was a little bit of a timing element. They weren't sure of the process, perhaps. They got involved in some zoning issues that were not high profile. It wasn't really clear what their agenda was. So as we think about uh, this, this issue, and this certainly coming into the session, we thought this was going to be a big deal. Uh, the, the request from Governor McDonald communicated in the State of the uh, Commonwealth Address that state employees start to pick up a share of their retirement. This was a, a, we really thought that was going to be a, a, a major issue in the session. Well, you look at the numbers, and, and it's something that, that I mean, $17.6 billion underfunded pension. I mean, that's something that should concern 
you know, anyone who lives within the state. And a lot of people are, who say, yeah, you balance the budget, but you, not so much because of that. Exactly, yeah. because if, you, if you're foregoing payments into this pension system, everyone knows that, all right, well, that's coming down the line. That's the, but the pension system and the pension needs aren't going to go away. And so what, what the governor tried to do was to, to put a fix in that where he said, all right, we're going to ask employees to put in 5%. I'm going to give you a 3% raise, so you only have to start chipping in 2%. Um, it ended up kind of getting kicked around in the budget negotiations, and they ended up with a five to five, which is five percent. We'll give you five, and you pay five. We'll give yeah. you five, and you pay five, and the money starts going into the system. And it sort of begins that negotiation, that discussion of, okay, well, you know, last year we started requiring new employees to pay in. Mm -hmm. Now we're paying five percent, but we're giving you five percent. Maybe a couple years down the road, we're going to start really talking about getting tough with you know, what, what needs to happen with the pension system to keep it solvent so yeah. these, these people's benefits are still and there. And of course, we're, everyone here in Virginia is watching this debate and this protest up in Wisconsin uh, where, where public employees are saying we want the right to collectively bargain and, uh, you know, we want what we want out of the budget. Uh, Virginia and North Carolina don't have collective bargaining for public employees anyway, and yet I wonder if they weren't a little bit emboldened on this particular issue by those protests. Perhaps. I think that um, state employees have the year legislators who realize uh, very painfully that they haven't given them a raise in four years, and so to ask them to give up something in a year when they've had a series of bad years, and also legislators um, are aware that they are the ones who made the decisions that have unfunded. Yeah have underfunded that pension plan and so legislators were hesitant to put all of that on to dump all of that onto these the, mm. the workers mm. so I think that's one we're going to come back to down the road because of that as you say that continuum may begin to shift and there's over no, time. there's no fix yeah. I mean there, there's no one year fix for, for 17 billion dollars worth of underfunded I mean this is going to have to be a deliberate concerted effort to say we need to manage this pension system in a better way and we need to have it perform better otherwise you know when when these folks start retiring and starting asking right. for the pension support it's not going to be there I mean, this is the refrain we hear on the radio show uh, pretty consistently around retirement plan around transportation is uh, the characterization is that the can is being kicked down the road that we're not really paying attention uh, to these issues in a meaningful way uh, you know I wonder as you we look ahead now the session is over but what happens next the uh, the, the governor has some work to do and uh, it will now be all about legislators worrying about their own destinies mm -hmm. uh, for redistricting. Uh, the legislature will start putting together its maps. We'll see uh, the college students have their maps. The governor's commission will endorse uh, possibly some of the college maps, mm -hmm. uh, possibly somebody else's. And so we're going to have more maps than anybody <laughs> can imagine what to do with. Too much information and meant much if not all of it will be available on the internet and you can that's going to really change really things, won't it, Dr. Richmond? I mean, in terms of democratizing all of this information. Well, though, though as Christina said, there's going to be so much information yeah. that sifting through it will be challenging. Maybe the average person is going to be like, I, I, time out, don't and that, That's one of the things. Redistricting is one of these processes, which is anybody who follows politics closely knows this is centrally important. Mm -hmm. This determines who's going to be in charge. In uh, Richmond, it determines what the composition of the delegation to Washington will look like. But most people aren't paying attention. Most people don't know how important it is. And uh, you know, at the same time, at the, I, I have some students who are interns in, in the uh, General Assembly. You know, they're, they're working on, OK, so they're thinking about, well, if we add this group into the district, and, and you know, these are the calculations every member Sure. of the General Assembly is engaging in right now. Wow. Oh, I need to bring in more people. Where do I want to bring in? Is there an app for that? In? That, I think, is the question we have to ask ourselves. <laughs> I want to talk in just a moment about some of the, uh, the statewide issues, because there are very interesting developments on the prospective Senate race and some, some other issues. But I, I probably will get a letter if I, don't, if I let this half hour pass uh, without asking about the status of public broadcasting funds, which were singled out among others in the governor's uh, State of the Commonwealth Address. What's yes. the status on that? Um, the, the budget negotiators did restore some of the funding, but there are still very deep cuts for public broadcasting. I think that was a theme of this budget negotiation. If you were targeted by either side for cuts, 
you were just fighting to add a few pennies back. And so, you know, I, th I think this is, in, in tight times, there is starting to be, um, for those people who want to shrink government, they have a little more push on this, and so they are starting to target specific line items in the budget, and they are gaining some ground in, in saying we're just not going to fund this anymore. Well, let's uh, telescope up to the Senate race that begins to take shape now that Senator Webb has said uh, thanks but no thanks, uh, one and done type of a situation. And, uh, you know, it was interesting because we were talking about this before. I think there were several folks who were saying, oh, yeah, he's going to run. I, my, I never was 100 He's so mercurial. It just never, you know, I never thought that was quite the done deal. But who, who's lining up here? We've got a, quite well, a number of folk. Well, now, I mean, now everyone's having the same discussion about Tim Kaine. Does, does he really want it? Yeah. Um, because you, you, you'd assume if he wanted it, we'd know by now. Right. Um, so all the indications that everyone's getting is that he's making a very deliberate decision and consulting his family. And you've got you've to gotta appreciate that it's, it's at least a dozen years in terms of a commitment. I mean, he, he's, he's making a massive commitment if he, if he does run. But, I mean, so you've got Tim Kaine, then you've got Tom Perriello, you know, Rick Bauscher. Yeah. He, and on the people Republic have mentioned Bobby Scott, yeah, you know, and then on the Republican side, George Allen. This but Tea he's Party got coverage. a lot of opposition, at, not opposition but, yet, but a lot of there are a lot of names being thrown. Well, around. one of the I'll interesting talk, things that, that a lot of people say is, listen, the more opposition that gets out there, the more factions can split off, and George can rise to the top very easily. Okay. Um, so the, having names in the race doesn't necessarily mean that he's got a lot of opponents in a race. If you've been any city council yeah. where there's an at-large bid, I mean, you know about the politicking where if I can get him in the race, right. he'll take and this he'll from take, her, right. and then, you know, by osmosis, I win. You know, I mean, they, yeah. they end up doing their all kinds of math, but on the Republican, I mean, both sides are very dynamic, and both sides... There's no, I mean, George Allen's is obviously a front runner, but there's been a lot of picking at him from behind. I don't know and that from there's. The right. And from the right. Mm -hmm. And I don't know that there's necessarily, you know, a single person that's kind of electrified the, the Republicans on that side of things. And the same for the Democrats. I mean, if Kim, Tim Kaine says no, he throws open the field to a lot of potential sort of maybe yeah. or could have runs that could suddenly become, you know, an interesting candidate in the race. And. I don't think either side is settled. Yeah, and there are some opposition from the right. I was thinking of the bishop who's been on this program. Bishop Jackson. Mm -hmm. Bishop Jackson from the Tea Party, who uh, who has kind of kind of being talked about uh, about as a possible mm -hmm. Republican candidate as well. And so there is interest all over the spectrum in this thing, which is going to make it a very well. Put it this way, I think y'all have job security. It's wide open. Yeah, because it really is. It's going to be a very interesting uh, race to watch as we as we move forward. So the next step in the budget, the governor gets to do a little bit of work, right? That's right. And uh, based on last year, he'll probably do a lot of work. Mm -hmm. um, the governor likes to really tinker around with the budget, and we can expect many, many amendments. He might still try to sneak in a little money here and there for things that got trimmed when uh, from his original proposal. He'll also be looking at uh, bills to veto, amend, or or sign, and so he hasn't made a decision yet on the autism bill, for example. So that's he's the got one some that gives benefits in companies with more than 50 employees to. That's right. It autism requires insurance. two to six. Two to six. For certain that's services. right. Yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. that's, I thought that was a very, very interesting right. bill, actually. So we'll see where all that goes, and then of course the legislature gets the chance to come back and see if they can muster up enough votes to override the governor's veto, and then that's pretty much it. I mean, really, how many times can you go back and take a look at this thing after all? Dr. Jesse Richmond, thank you for being with us. I, I want to have you back to talk about those maps. That's what we'll do. We'll have maybe we'll get some students in to talk about their maps. That would, would that be, be all right? Yeah, I, think I think that would be that. so fun. We have so many great colleges and universities here. We'll put them all around the table. I'll bet they're as good as anybody else comes up with. Uh, Christina Knuckles, thank you for being with us and for thank making you. the drive from Richmond to do so. Kimball Payne, welcome back home. Nice to have you back. It's good to be back. And we'll be back in a moment uh, with a look at a great way to spend your Saturday night. Uh, you know, these dance competitions are all the rage these days, and you won't find one better than the one in Williamsburg this weekend. It is not too late to get the best ticket in town. It's called Dancing with the Williamsburg Stars, and it benefits Big Brothers, Big Sisters of the Greater Virginia Peninsula. That is 
Town Bank Williamsburg president Ann Connor looking very dishy there in her uh, costume from last year. It also uh, benefits both Big Brothers Big Sisters and uh, Literacy for Life at the Rita Welsh Adult Learning Center. Uh, I emceed this thing last year and I have to tell you I knew it was going to be the place to be again this year as well. Lots of local Williamsburg community leaders, very kind, brave and generous with their time and their talents. There's a minister and another bank manager and a school board member. Even Kim Lenz who has graced this stage with her feet firmly in place at our editorial roundtable will take the stage and dance. They've been working with professional partners from Seven Cities Ballroom for several weeks now and the show will be terrific. Tickets still available at the Phi Beta Kappa box office by phone at 757-221-2675 or online at wm.tix.com. Calm. And Norfolk's about to be invaded in the best possible way by more than a thousand high school dancers who will be in town between March 10th and 13th. There are master classes, workshops, and all kinds of activities that are luring all those dancers along with some professionals from about 36 dance organizations who will be there to recruit and offer scholarships. There's even going to be an improv jam on Granby Street. Want to see that near the federal building? And you'll be able to tell our special dancing guests because. They will, after all, be the ones leaping across the crosswalks. Well, to watch this program again or any of our past broadcasts, you can visit our website. That's whatmatters.tv, and that's where you can also find any number of ways to get in touch with us. Y'all always manage to find us. We're also on Facebook, where you can join us as a fan as well. And, of course, on the radio for more local talk, I hope you'll join us for Hearsay. That's 89.5 WHRV-FM, and we are live each weekday at noon. And we'll be taking your calls there as well. Thanks again for watching. I'm Kathy Lewis. We'll see you next time for another look at What Matters.